is based on real events in the life of Dieter Dengler. We have a very early moment in his life where everything somehow started out. And that is a senseless attack by bombers who couldn't drop their ordnance on the German city during the Second World War because there were clouds. So on the way back, they dropped everything on a tiny little village in the Black Forest, Dieter's village. He's on the third floor in this little house and looking at the mayhem coming at him and a diver bomber comes right down at him, shooting from its wing tips into the house with a machine gun. And Dieter sees the pilot and for a split of a second their eyes meet. Dieter says, I was not afraid, I was mesmerized. This was like almighty beings out of the clouds. I, I knew I had to be one of them. And he says that was the moment where little Dieter needed to fly. Um, he came over to America when he was 17 to become a pilot. He joined the Air Force um, you know, for a couple of years, enrolled, um, didn't speak a lick of English, came over with zero money whatsoever, and you know, learned English so he can enroll in the officer's academy and become a Navy pilot. And they put him on an aircraft carrier, and 40 minutes in his first mission, he's been shot down. And he's the only American POW who actually managed to escape from North Vietnamese and Laotian captivity. And somehow the story was so big and the character was so much larger than life that it was instantly clear this had to be a, a feature film. But since it took a while to get the finances together, Dieter Dengler and I did a documentary, Little Dieter Needs to Fly. I recall very clearly when I showed Dieter Dengler the documentary, he turns to me and without missing a beat, he says, Werner, this is unfinished business. Rescue Dawn certainly is not a war movie. Back in 1965 in Vietnam, it was not a very big affair. Dida was delighted to go there because he, he was dreaming of the Go-Go Girls. They were telling me all about the fantastic massage parlors, Go-Go Girls, everything. And now what did I get? Goddamn one night, <laughs> one night in Saigon. Yeah. 40 minutes in his first mission, he finds himself shot down. So it only starts in a war situation. The thing that makes this one so different is Dita's optimism and smiling face and his philosophy of positivity. It's a film about optimism and, and self-reliance and loyalty and courage. It's about survival. Dita, he knew that nobody was coming to rescue him and he overcame because he was so eternally optimistic and he would be tortured, but he would come out smiling. He would answer animosity, you know, with a joke. Hey! Hey! Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. This is for shaving. Howdy. And I think it just so disarmed people and annoyed people as well, um, but inspired. And he became the unlikely leader of these uh, POWs and orchestrated um, uh, an escape. Dieter said, uh, Werner, this is going to be a film you will make for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, and they will be proud of the movie. And I said, Dieter, I'll, this is a big, big sort of load on my shoulder, but I, I'll try to do my best. I think it's a story which will last for, for the ages. with Werner and I liked the questions that he had for me because they weren't the ordinary questions that directors often ask. We sat down and we got a drink and, and then he started in with, so have you got any interest in swimming through snake infested rivers? What do you think about sleeping the night in the jungle and probably waking up with leeches all over you, you know? Um, how do you feel about biting the head off of a live snake? Uh, kind of curious questions on a first meeting. Oh, 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 oh. 
And they could see also that he was somebody who was really going to push himself and challenge himself and exhaust himself. And it was going to be a very strenuous exercise, making a movie with him, which is exactly what he wanted. Christian Bale was studying the documentary footage. He spoke to the family, saw all uh, written things. But we decided very quickly it should not be a, a pure imitation now of Dieter Dengler. Werner said, you know, look, we can't get hung up on impersonations here, you know. Uh, we are making a movie. You know, we're not making a documentary now. He said to me, absolutely. Watch him study him, but he said, I really don't have to try and pick up his mannerisms and do whatever. I found some of them to be very charming, and I just wanted to include certain things. But there was never any pressure of, hey, look, we have to make this exactly the man. It's more the spirit of the man, as I saw it, and, and as Werner saw it. The young Dieter Dengler was an exceptionally handsome young man. Uh, had great charm, has in incredible youthful optimism. And I think Christian Bale embodied uh, many of the qualities. He even <laughs> looks like uh, the young Dieter Dengler. Jut, jut! Gene, come, come! Fire! <laughs> I was a big fan of Werner's before I met him. And when he told me, I'd like you to play Duane and it's going to be really tough, I said, I'm fine with it, no matter what. Steve Zahn, he has done some early films that hint much more into the direction of what he does as Dwayne Martin in Rescue Dawn. Everybody's known Steve Zahn as a comedian, but this guy has just tremendous talent. He has a very vulnerable and wonderful human quality in him. He's the one whom you want to hug and hold on to and help him and assist him. I can't go any longer. Steve is a great actor. He's hilarious. I mean, he would have me just crying with laughter. I knew it. It was the right choice. I have never really made mistakes in casting. And if you do not understand that part of the profession, you, you shouldn't make films. You have to somehow understand the heart of men. Dwayne Martin. Dwayne Martin, I'm Dieter Dengler. United States Air Force, I was shot down about a year and a half ago. I played Dwayne Whitney Martin. He's from Denver, Colorado. He was a first lieutenant in the Air Force. He was with the 38th Air and Rescue and Recovery. And he was shot down in 65, 40 miles into Laos. The other guys in the crew escaped and he was captured by LA Ocean Guards. And that's really all I know other than what we know from Dieter's story, which is sad. Oh, there is war. There is war. Jeremy Davis was instantly convincing. It was absolutely clear, yes, that's him. Jeremy Davis, he's somebody who walks to the beat of his own drum. He arrived being incredibly self-sufficient. He would carry everything on his back. He was like a snail, you know, he had his own water, his own food, everything, you know, so he didn't need anybody else to be coming near him. By the way, Gene. I played Eugene De Bruyne based on a real person, and there's not much known about the real Gene beyond the fact that he flew for Air America and he was shot down two years before Dieter shows up and doesn't know there's a war going on and believes that they'll be released at any time. We will be released by the time the rain comes. I think what Gene brings is a greater complexity in the overall film. You understand it. Not everyone responds to this kind of experience, to war, to, to, to captivity, to torture, in the same way. He's the character who represents the opposing force. If you try to escape, we, we will be killed. We who you leave behind. It should be noted that Jean de Bruyne's family disagrees strongly with his depiction in the film. They describe him as a gentle, very kind family man, and I have no doubt in my heart that they describe him correctly. However, that's always a problem about storytelling. We do not show his story from five different perspectives. You would end up with five different movies, and I only wanted to make it out of the perspective of of Dieter Dengler. And of course, under these inhuman conditions, diarrhea, years in footblocks, cross handcuffed, they had uh, moments where he says that we would have strangled each other if we had had a hand free. We should be aware that Jean de Bruyne 
at the end when they escaped took care of the sick YC, the Hong Kong Chinese, and refused to leave him. And I find this extremely noble. And Jean de Bruin served his country with great honor. Unfortunately, I came across this only very, very recently, way after the film was done. Probably that would have been included. Stop. Galen, he's one of those cases where you instantly know that's him. No doubt in my heart for one second. And when you see his torso naked, you see that he has some strange shot of his torso missing. What actually happened is he was shot, survived it, and he had a, a very, very colorful life, to say the least. Bernard, he says, I want you to take a look at this character. He's a smuggler from Hong Kong. And I kind of told him my background, my history, and I said, well, I'm kind of experienced in both, you know, smuggling and Hong Kong. So I, I could tell the job was my head by the way he was smiling and everything. They call me YC. OK, YC. YC. Hi, I'm Dieter Dengler. The film was shot in Thailand in 44 days. And because it takes you five, six months, to lose weight systematically, slowly, under supervision, but you can gain it back in three, four weeks. So we had to shoot the end of the film first and then progressively backwards. And how do you develop a character in the story when you're walking backwards through it? It was really important to me and, uh, and I know to Steve and, and Christian to, to not show up looking like uh, well-fed, uh, pampered Hollywood actors who just walked from their trailer to the to the set, you know. We really felt that we'd be disrespectful if we didn't have an authentic um, prison camp weight class. You know, no one told us we had to lose weight. You just did it, you know, because that's your job. Jeremy Davis was dedicated to an amount where he uh, would, would really scare me. He's a very skinny man, but he lost even more weight. And I had to persuade him, don't, don't lose anymore. When I got to Thailand and I showed up on set, they go, damn, this dude's skinny. And, and they were really jealous because everyone was trying to get skinny as hell. And they just drink water mostly. But what they don't know is before I was filming in Thailand, I had renal failure, sepsis. My, my organs shut down. I was in the hospital and almost died. And I was like, oh man, am I gonna be able to shoot this thing? It's basically like pull my IVs out after a week and a half or something. I was just real weak and just, just trying to gain some weight back. So while all these dudes are like eating fruit and everything, when I get back to my hotel, I'm like eating, I'm eating like crazy, eating anything I wanna eat. And they were like starving. <laughs> whoa, 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 what makes you think you are not crazy for thinking that what, man? Gene's right, you don't attract too much attention. No, oh, God. Christian Bale, Steve Zahn, Jeremy Davis, Galen, and all the extras, all the smaller parts, they really wanted to do something out of the ordinary. These wonderful actors, they meant business. There's not one who is not really good and at his best. It's a, a wonderful moment in my life as a filmmaker. I have been blessed to get them together and uh, having them so ready to work with me. I think in the film industry, much of the energy and attention has turned into digital effects. I want audiences back in a, in a position where they can trust their eyes again. Doing uh, things like uh, having the actors plow through the thickest of jungle, barefoot and vines and thorns and underbrush. And every single child who watches the film will tell you immediately, this is not a digital effect. Scream! Yell! Scream! You should scream! Yeah, yeah, no, no, not too much reaction here. Yeah, no. A lot of people seem to think Werner is kind of sadistic. Pushing other people, making them do things that they, they don't want to do. But he's not sadistic at all, and I found it appealing to work with somebody who is an adventurer. Uh, somebody who is wanting to push himself. Werner is beyond unique. He wasn't just demanding things from us just out of his own pleasure and entertainment and 
and knew that there was risk involved. And so when there was something that was unpleasant, he made sure that he did it first. It's nice knowing that it's not somebody sitting back with a lot of distaste looking at somebody else doing something they would never dream of doing themselves. He would do more than what was asked of us. He would roll up his pants, take his shoes off, climb over any thorns. If there was any call for Steve and I to be wading through snake infested waters or going down a rapid, then um, you bet that Werner was going to be jumping in there first. I think Werner came away with pretty much no toenails. Pretty much every day he had some kind of cut, um, blood dripping somewhere. And he likes that. You know, he, he enjoys it. I think he likes to, uh, uh, to test himself. I left no doubt that it would be very, very physical and, and really very demanding. And it's not just the jungle you see, uh, Christian is eating live maggots. I do everything that I'm asking you to do. I will volunteer to show you the maggots are okay. Christian said, no, no, come on, don't do it this time. I, I'm, get, I'm getting over with it. You just roll the cameras. Certainly working with Werner is not monotonous, you know, it's something new uh, every day. The photography is mind-boggling. Nobody has put photography on the screen like Werner has. I mean, his DP, who I was a little hesitant about at first, Peter Zeitlinger, did just the most amazing job of capturing the scenery. I discovered him through a, a documentary where he was a cinematographer, and the film was put down by everyone, even though it was a great film, and I asked the best newspaper in, in Austria at the time, I demand that I write the review and I write a very raving review uh, about uh, the film. And the last sentence said the real discovery in this film um, is the cinematographer Peter Zeitlinger. Well, Werner and I have worked 12 years together and so he trusts a lot in what I am doing and so he can concentrate very well on the on the actors and on the work on the scenes. With Peter Zeitlinger there was never any problem of, of uh, making myself understood because we have done uh, some, some 12 films or 10 films at least together, I can't even count them, very quickly one after the other. We play together like ice hockey players, we know when, whenever we, we, we are in front of the goal and and how we managed to come around the problems and, and to, to make the goal. I like his physicality um, and I like his uh, sense for, for movement and rhythm. He's the only cinematographer who drops the camera and he says, well, uh, the scene has no rhythm. So you do not hear that quite often from a cinematographer. Werner directs a scene like a reality. He does not direct it like a part of a movie. He directs the situation and then I come in with the camera. If it's a dolly, if it's a handheld camera, if it's a, a crane movement, it's always following the, the scene as a part of a reality. And the most easiest and most direct way to achieve this is handheld camera. That's the reason why Werner likes it the most. Usually Werner does not like uh, fancy film techniques. Uh, but in this case we had everything with us. We had big cranes, we had big lamps, we had helium balloons. Um, sometimes Werner even doesn't like the simple dolly shots. He just say put the sticks here and let's shoot it. And, but with this crew it was possible to set up all these things uh, before we started the scene. So when Werner and the actors came, so everybody was ready and we just used it whenever it was necessary. Look around here, behind you. What the hell happened? Why didn't you show up at the kitchen? Huh? Gene? Gene? Where the hell were you? In this scene, I worked with a 14mm lens, which is very wide. And this wide angle lens makes a possibility that you can, with a small movement, the whole perspective of the world you are looking in is changing. 
With one step forward and one step back you can go from a close up to a wide shot. And this is a very physical possibility with very small and quick movements to change the scene's perspective. And I think this this was achieved very well in this scene. This is one of the favorite I've ever shot. The only thing where I always had to watch out that Peter has a tendency to make things pretty or, or have some light, uh, has aesthetics in it. And I keep saying there must be no aesthetics planned. Aesthetics has to creep in through uh, under the door or through the leaks in the roof. And so it, it, it will, it has to come as a natural concomitant. Sometimes I have to stop him to try to do something aesthetical. And I, I, I put the brakes on him, but that's fine. And, and we have a good beer afterwards and laugh over it. The prison camp footage was done pretty far in the south. We went away from the ocean and something like 15 miles inland. When we came the first time to the prison camp, the huts were built out of solid bamboo, so no light came in. And when I said, Werner, we, we have to do something with the hut. It is not good that it's so solid. It has to be with holes and it has to have some gaps and so some openings where the light can come through. Um, but uh, this was not a problem, he said. Here, there's the machete, he gave me a machete. My camera assistant also has one in his pocket. We put them out and went and made and destroyed the hut. It looked then really like a prison hut and also to make the possibility that that we could put light in so we could see the action inside and we could see the actors <laughs> so the, the rough part about shooting was it always rained when it wasn't supposed to rain all of a sudden you have monsoon rain and you should have a uh, dry uh, area outside when you have a uh, ground like in the prison compound which is some sort of reddish clay soil when it rains you cannot disguise that there is rain no matter what light what reflectors you put on it it's it's just wet and we were barefooted all the time so every time you stepped in the ground in this red clay it was like it's sucking you in so you had to like just to, just for your feet to get in and out, in and out, in and out. When everything was wet out there and in puddles of water all over the place, uh, I quickly moved into a different scene that played indoors, which was not planned, of course, for, for the actors and for the technical crew, sometimes hard to take because I had to improvise. And they were worried about dialogue because there was tarps over the roof and you could hear the plastic going. <laughs> Okay, no. <laughs> I don't see how they cleaning up the sound so you can't hear the rain. We were kind of imprisoned on this set. Yeah. Wet, sloggy, crappy, you know, rain coming in at three and being chained together for an extended period of time. And I remember being chained together and we had like one key and it was like, I remember sometimes getting claustrophobic and they would forget about the key. You know, somebody would be busy and it'd be like, where's the key? be like 15 minutes later, like, get us out of here. You know, I can't imagine what it was like to just sit for hours on end just being chained together. And just, just an hour of this or two hours of this, which we did do, you would get unchained and you would just, I can't tell you how much it hurt. Just to have your arms in a very different position, yeah, it's very claustrophobic, very hot, and essential to us telling a story in the way it should be told. My ring. Yeah, he took my ring. It was wonderful to work in some very small villages where we would arrive and they'd kind of be looking at us a little suspiciously. And I was kind of being like Dita. He was very friendly to everybody. and always wanted to say hello, the first to say hello to everybody. And he'd be saying hello and they just wouldn't be answering me. And then I'd get tied up behind a buffalo and they'd drag me around the town for the day. And I had some of them come to me, like looking at me like, why are you letting them treat you this way? You know, you shouldn't let them do this to you. And then they were told, hey, you know what, kick some dirt in this guy's face. And gradually they realized, oh, this, these people are sort of crazy. And uh, this is kind of fun having them around. Uh, 
And after they put the ant's nest on my head and they were spinning me around, we couldn't stand up straight for like three days because Werner was trying to shout to the guys, stop spinning. They didn't understand what he was saying, so they kept spinning faster. I'm bound with my arms, you know, behind my back, my legs. I can't stop them. I've got ants crawling all up and down my face and my throat, and I'm covered with an ant's nest head. And they just keep spinning and spinning and spinning, getting faster. And Werner's shouting more and more, stop, stop. And they think, go more, more. And they just go. And I tell you, I just, I couldn't stand up straight for about three days or something after that. I remember the first day that we did that stuff coming down that waterfall and crossing the river. Oh my God, Christian and I were so tired. We were sitting next to this rock talking and we both passed out. I mean, deep sleep, kind of like. And we, we heard someone say, all right, let's get going. And we both woke up and there was a camera right in front of us. And Werner was standing behind filming us sleeping. And I thought that was really cool. You know, half the time you used to be sitting there doing nothing. And suddenly you realize you get, you know, being filmed. We weren't acting, you know. Was it any different that if we were acting? I don't know. But he was able to, he would just shoot stuff like that. It was nice at times when the camera was so kind of hidden that you almost didn't know where it was. And I liked that a lot. I like working that way. Can you try to find the camera? With Werner, you don't have a whole day to do a scene where you're just talking. There might be two takes of him just going from one person to the other. You better know your stuff, and everybody did. You have to be at your most creative and free and fearless. We didn't ponder things for very long. We didn't have time to or the luxury to. So we really attacked it quickly and instinctually. You hang it, wait, okay? The fear is that you're just missing something. Because there ain't no going back to it. I remember saying that a few times. Hey, we can't come back here. We might, but I'm not going to be this thin, I'll tell you that. Let's make sure we got everything before we move on. And working that fast was difficult at first, but it became, I, I love it. And now, if I go do something and somebody asks me to do seven takes, I'm like, oh gosh, take all day, gee. Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, I like that speed. It really keeps you on your toes. It was a blast. It really was. So what are they saying? What they're discussing is this. They said the villagers out to forge for some rice. They came back with nothing. There's one time where I had this speech about they're going to march us out to the jungle and they're going to kill us. And the ones that are involved are Little Hitler and Crazy Horse. And Werner said, remember, you got to say Crazy Horse last. And I'm all freaked out. Luckily, I did it, and then they switched the cameras around, and it was like Christian's close-up. I really screwed up for him. I said, uh, Little Hitler and Sitting Bull, and, and Christian is like trying not to laugh and all that. And then after the cameras were off, he goes, Wah! Very good, yes. And he, he was pretty cool. He only had two takes. He, he held it in pretty good, I think. I wanted it to be a memorable experience. I didn't much care about how I wanted to enjoy myself and have a great time. I did actually have a great time. We would have an awful lot of laughs during the making of the movie. But a lot of it was kind of that uh, sort of crazy laughter. <laughs> The crazier the place we were, the more absurd situation we were in, it was going to be more funny to us. <laughs> and it would be better jokes. It was, it was, it was a blast. We were verging on going crazy uh, out there. We're kind of loving it. I went along to uh, a travel doctor before I left, and he asked me, he said, what are you going to be doing? And I said, well, me swimming in snake-infested waters, and uh, I'm going to be eating maggots, and I'm going to be traipsing through the jungle barefoot, probably getting a bunch of leeches on me, you know, spiders as well. And he just kind of looked at me curiously. He was like, well, I've never had I have to deal with this kind of request. You're actually going to purposely do these things? Like normally that's people accidentally fall into. And I remember he said to me, well, look, pretty much, you know, 
you should be okay if you just, you know, use your common sense and you're looking out for the certain things and ask for a snake coming and biting you when you're in the river. I can't really help you out there. But he said, the one thing you want to look out for is he said, down in the south of Thailand, in, in still stagnant waters, there's a tiny snail. And he said, it looks absolutely harmless. But he said, that's the real one you want to look out for. Like, you can get paralyzed from those things. He said, so whatever you do, just don't, don't be doing that at all. And then, so we're shooting down in the south of Thailand, and it's a scene where Dita gets captured, and it's taking a little while for some reason to set the guys up who are gonna capture me, and I'm just lying with my face, looking into this stagnant, small pond that I'm about to put my head into. And I look down and I see, oh, there they are. There are those little snails that the doctor told me about. Whatever I do, do not go near those snails whatsoever. Keep away. And then it's, Christian, put your head in the water, please. <laughs> so there I am, looking at the water straight out these things. And, uh, you know, I came out okay. It was, there was kind of a sense of fun of like defying what the doctor had told me was uh, a sensible thing to do. <laughs> and hopefully this is not something that takes years to develop or something. <laughs> I remember one time I was laying under this big leaf and we were hiding and they're trying to figure out the camera and everything. And by this time in the movie, ants crawling all over you and biting you was like, just whatever. There's just, there's no fighting it. At first I was like, oh my God, there's fire, you know, and it, it, after a while, I was forget it. So I was laying there waiting for the shot and the ants were biting me and I saw this caterpillar like just inching across the top and they'd move the leaf to see my face and see the focus. And I kept looking at this local guy looking at the caterpillar and I caught his eye, I was like, what dude? The caterpillar? He's like, He's like, oh, the caterpillar's poisonous? <laughs> Is that what you're trying to say? Hey, Werner, caterpillar's poisonous. He's like, oh, I love it. It's in the thing, and we are going to shoot it. And, and then I said, it's poisonous, though, man. And it's, there's a hole right here by my neck. It's going to, he's like, it's not poisonous. Look, see, I, it's fine. And he had it in his hand. And, they, and then he was like, oh, right, get the, get the camera. And they kept talking. I kept looking at <laughs> the local guy was looking at his hand. And then Werner, <laughs> no one saw it, but he was like, <laughs> down he's like it's like see it's poisonous isn't it that hurt Vern is uh, yeah possibly the most hands-on director that I've ever come across one story the very first day of filming there's a few hundred guys there and they're celebrating the return of Dita and I heard that Verne likes to always do the clapperboard he likes to be the last person making eye contact with the actors he likes to really feel like he's almost a part of the scene and uh, at one point I found myself I'm being carried on the shoulders of all these guys and I look down and Werner is in the scene. He's lying on the floor, on his back, trying to tell people what to do from there. There are guys, extras, treading on him on his chest, treading on his fingers all over the place. I can see him kind of yowling with pain, but at the same time trying to direct from inside of the scene, you know? I mean, he was completely within the frame, just hidden by the extras, but he's down there in the midst of it. Okay, Chris, let's, let's go. Over. Werner was in the front lines, always. And many times we'd have a convoy of maybe five vans. We were just gonna go look for somewhere, head off into the jungle for a little while. And Werner would say to the driver, faster, 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 we must lose them. And he wanted to lose the rest of the crew because he had me, he had Steve, he had uh, Peter Zeitling of the DP and Eric the Focus pulling. He was like, what else do we need? We can make this whole movie with the, you know, the six of us. It was kind of refreshing sometimes for uh, everyone to leave the clumsy apparatus behind and do things where the apparatus cannot help you anyway. You have to have the agility. You have to have the presence of mind as a filmmaker to, uh, to sense the moment. Aha, they are all going for lunch now and uh, and so let's grab a camera and, and, and the two actors and let's do something within the next half hour. So we would lose everybody else and we would uh, pull off down into the jungle and go shoot a scene and sometimes totally improvised scene, sometimes a scripted thing and then the others would eventually catch up and they'd say, all right, what are we doing? Like, oh, we've done it. We filmed it already, we did something. And uh, some of the best footage was shot that way. Werner was clearly somebody who got the same pleasure from making a movie as I imagine he did when he was 20 years old. And he didn't give a damn how most movies were made. And the crew were obsessed with him. The conversation every night was Vern. What had he done today? What was he gonna be doing tomorrow? He would always be helping everybody with their jobs, doing it more intensely than an awful lot of people. And there were some people who realized that it was just too much for him. And we had about half the crew quit one day. We kept going. 
we just kept filming half the crew and we figured out how to get to the set because all the drivers had gone. And I had days when I, I wanted to hug Werner and we were just, and other days when I just wanted to, you know, just charge him and take him out, you know? He's certainly somebody who provokes a reaction. As a matter of fact, people always claim that I have an odd way of shooting. Now I'm very professional. And um, not one single time in, in almost 60 films, I went over budget and not, I went under budget a couple of times. And not one single time I went over schedule. And Rescue Dawn was put in the can two days under schedule. Sometimes there was no money and no transportation department. It's always like this in, in movies. We shouldn't complain about it. And I, I always saw it with an amount of humor. Okay, fellas. Stay out of trouble. Come Thank back in one piece. Good luck. Come back, boys. When Dieter says this is unfinished business, he knew exactly what he meant. Um, in the documentary, for example, he refers to some tensions and suspense between the um, um, prisoners in a very superficial way. He did not want to hurt any feelings. Fact is, and I know it in detail from Dieter, there were very, very severe conflicts among the prisoners. And of course, that is great stuff for a feature film. There's a scene that is quite remarkable because it's so incredibly well acted. It's uh, the conflict between Dieter Dengler, Christian Bale, and Jeremy Davis as Eugene de Bruyne. When uh, Eugene threatens to yell out the moment Dieter tries to escape because he's dreaming of, of being released anyway and he would jeopardize uh, their release. Gene's perspective was, you have to understand, we've been here for two years and uh, you're proposing that you understand the camp well enough and that you know what's going on and you know what the risks are. We will be released. We will be released by the time they on target. And the way the suspense is built up and how dangerous the scene gets ultimately lives from the intensity of the performance. I really appreciated Werner allowing me to take it as, as far as we did to really, and to not trivialize it, to, to say like, listen, this is, you know, this is where I'm coming from, and I think it's I think it's a risk. I really do think we will be killed if you if you really want to go through with this heroic impulse. You tell me where to go. Huh? Huh? I don't know where you can go. Didn't think so. Didn't think so. I mean, look what happened. Who's to say if the odds were better to stay and maybe get killed in the camp or better to go and, I mean, look what happened to Jane, you know? One of the last things Dita says in the movie is empty what is full, Phil. Phil, what is empty? Dita's survival technique was you keep yourself busy, you keep moving, and you look at what's right in front of you. Don't look at the whole big picture, which can be too horrifying. Deal with the essentials, and um, and the rest will sort itself out. This is unusual. You American pilots normally attack us earlier in the day. Sit. The scene with the provincial governor uh, is is a, a very important moment in the film. The province governor gives Dieter a piece of paper that he wants him to sign saying, I reject America. Basically a confession that he's wrong and that, uh, you know, that uh, what they're doing is wrong. Dieter is shown as someone who came to America with a big vision, a big dream to fly. Now, since America gave him the possibility to fly and helped him to fulfill his dream, he's utterly loyal. And even under torture, he will not sign 
the propaganda letter that almost everyone signed who was American POW in North Vietnam or in Laos. All he has to do is sign this piece of paper and he won't have to go through all this stuff. And if you, you kind of put yourself in his place, you think, well, geez, me, he could sign it and then later on say, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean it or just whatever, you know, you had to do just to get out of there. And it reveals his love of his adopted country. I love America. America gave me wings. I will not sign it. Absolutely not. No way. I like this basic notion of loyalty to a country and Dieter had it in terms of human qualities that I like in Americans. A kind of courage and loyalty and self-reliance and perseverance. So even though he's an immigrant, he's in a way quintessential American. The real Dieter Dengler said to me, well, of course I started to understand that they were nasty to me. They had reason to be nasty because I dropped a few bombs on an intersection of, of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I missed. I'm your true friend. I'm your true friend. I will not lie to you. I will never let you down, okay? Never. The film is about the test and trial of men. If we can make it to the Mekong River. Yeah, Big Muddy. If you could, you would, right? Yeah, we can. It's the entire story of a man with this incredible determination and self-reliance, a true frontier spirit. There is something very inspiring in Dita himself and in his lack of cynicism and his eternal curiosity and interest in people. But there's no kind of a large epiphany moment. It's just the day-to-day -day reality of being in that situation and how quickly as human beings we can actually manage to adapt to that. I would always have Dieter as, as, as a role model. Well, something which I thought was very charming about the guy is Dieter appeared to me to find it very difficult to actually differentiate between different people, even with the enemy. He knows it's the enemy, but he sees them as individuals, each by name, each with a different character, some he despises, some he thinks are fantastic. Till this day, when there's some sort of complication and, and some sort of a de decision to take, where well, I don't know what, what should I do now, and I ask myself, what would Dida do? What would Dida do?